Welcome back to this machine learning tutorial on classifying Pokemon as legendary or not. In this video, we'll be building on our previous work and finally create a powerful neural network model using PyTorch. So if you haven't already, don't forget to watch part one and join us as we take our Pokemon classification skills to the next level. Okay, in the last episode, we finished with those two dataset classes, right? Now we want to finally get to building a neural network. But first for that, we'll need to import quite a few new libraries. We'll have to import the neural network module, which we will inherit from to build the PyTorch um, neural network, right? Then we will want to define a data loader, which is, you know, it's very similar to the data set. And it uses the data set module, but now it will just return batches of data samples. We will of course need a optimizer, which will be, and we will be using the Atom optimizer, of course. For a little evaluation, we'll be using a confusion matrix. And finally, we'll also have an image to be a bit more visual, right? So I've already installed all of this and I've already written out all the code, honestly, to just make this whole process a bit quicker because otherwise the video will take way too long. But let's start with this first cell here. And this cell is really the little hyperparameter cell that I've defined. And we'll see what all of those hyperparameters are used for when we get to the specific parts. Um, but let's just run this specific cell. And, we'll, and we can see that the first thing that we want to do is build this data loader. And as mentioned, the data loader just takes in the data set that we've defined last episode. And, also and we also need to specify the batch size. For the training data set, we have now here defined a, as a hyperparameter a batch size of 32. You can play around with this hyperparameter as much as you like and see how much it um, increases or reduces the performance of your neural network. But this just means that for training, we'll be using a batch of data instead of single samples. Instead, uh, except for the test loader, there we have a batch size of one, which just means that we'll be taking one sample at a time. And you'll see why we are using this for the final evaluation. But yeah, let's just quickly run the cell and get to the nice neural network. Okay, so this again is standard boilerplate PyTorch code. Um, we are defining the initialize function for our neural network module that um, inherits from the nn.module um, class. And we here define our several layers. Now this is quite a lot and we'll go through this. In, it's like the basic neural network here is not that complex, right? It's one linear layer, a second linear layer, and a output layer, right? With some hidden size, and the output will produce one output, one neuron, that will simply have to predict a zero or a one. Now, what are all those crazy things in between? Okay, like a activation function that is also nothing you have to assume, you already have quite a bit of neural network knowledge. Um, and the thing that we've included here is a normal batch norm layer, right? Again, with a hidden size of 64. Okay, I guess we could just also use hidden size here. Um, and this is again used to improve the performance. But what is, and this is nothing too crazy, this is used very often. And what is even more important is this little dropout layer that we have here before the final output layer. And dropout just means that there are a certain amount of neurons in your one layer in this case, layer, layer two. And dropout just means that with a probability of one of 10%, some neurons will just deactivate. And this introduces a certain amount of noise, an amount of uncertainty, which allows the model to generalize better, to have some sort of margin around the actual um, decision boundary. So this is just the neural network architecture. I can't go too much into detail here, um, into how dropout and batch norm work, but this is really helpful when dealing with datasets that are imbalanced. And then we have the simple forward function that we have to define, which is nothing special. We just take the inputs to our neural network and then pass it through every single layer that we have defined above in our init function. So that's pretty much it. We can now just run the cell and then initialize our model, right? We initialize our model by taking the input shape, right? We have our training set here and we just take the size of the or the, the number of columns that we have, right? 
And then we provide the hidden size, which we have defined above, right, as a hyperparameter. Then we push our model to our device. In my case, the device is just my CPU. Um, and then we define the loss function and the optimizer. We are using, as a loss function, we're using the binary cross entropy loss with logit loss. Um, again, I can't go too much into detail about this loss function. It's a simple little math formula. And for the optimizer, we're using Adam, where we also have to specify a hyperparameter, which is the learning rate. Again, we have defined it up here. And if you want to run this cell, we can again have a little description of how our model looks. This is nothing new. We, have, we already know how our model looks since we have defined it up here. Um, and that's that. Again, this is just building up a new network with Lego blocks. You can play around with it as much as you want. We can add more layers. You can take out the one layer here. You can add dropouts in, into the first layer here. You can add, um, remove batch norm or whatever. Just play around as if it were Lego blocks. Now, the next thing that we want to have is our accuracy metric. Why do we need an accuracy metric? We have our loss function that we use that we'll use to quantify how well our model is performing. Well, our loss is not that human readable or intuitive, right? It's just a value that is reduced if the model pr predicts proper uh, labels, but there's a bit more math behind that. This binary accuracy loss that we have implemented here simply compares the output if it is correct, right? If it produces a, the, our model produces a output of zero and the expected output is also zero, well, that's a true output and that's nice. And this just computes the percentage of correct outputs for a certain batch, right? If we have our test set, which um, had how many samples? Let's quickly go up and see, which had 258 samples. Out of those 258 samples, what percentage was predicted correctly? So that's all there is to this binary uh, accuracy. And again, this was now given the example of this test set, but we also use this binary accuracy to log our performance during training. And that means we'll now get to this training loop here. And the first line of code is this little model.train. And what this does is it sets our neural network into train mode. And this is only really important for the dropouts or batch norm layers. If you don't have those, you don't really need to set the model into train mode. Um, but this is really important because the model um, works a bit differently if it is in train mode or, infer or, or inference mode. This is especially obvious for the dropout layer, right? During training, we want to imp uh, introduce this little noise or uh, this little noise, right, into the training process to make it more general our model. But during inference, we don't want to drop any neurons. We want to have a clean prediction of our input. So this is really important. We now set it into train mode. So we activate the dropout layer and activate the batch norm layer. And later when doing the evaluation, we'll need to set it into model.evil mode to um, get rid of this, pretty much get rid of the dropout layer and also change the way batch norm works. So we here have our, a, again, a very standard um, learning or training loop. And the outer mo most outer loop is the loop that loops over the epochs, right? And for each epoch, we loop over the da whole data set, right? So we train our model on the same data multiple times. In our case, our epoch is, uh, uh, is defined as 20, so we um, tra learn on our data set for 20 times. This, this means that in our second inner loop, we actually loop over the batches in our training set. And that's all there is to it. What then happens is we take our inputs and we take our output and push it to the device. Again, in my case, it's just the CPU. Then we run optimizer.zero grad. And this is important because we need to do that every time because after one iteration over a batch, we have gradients stored in our neural network. And if we don't reset those gradients every time when we again run a loss.backward and optimizer step, we'll pretty much add on top of the already stored gradients, which is not what we want to do.
So this is very important, optimizer.zerograd. Then we just run the prediction of our model, right? And then we can compute the loss by having our prediction and um, comparing it to the actual real output that we want to have, the ground truth labels. We then have our um, accuracy metric to see what percentage of this batch was um, predicted correctly. Then we do the standard loss dot backwards to compute the gradients and then actually um, back propagate everything um, and change the weights of our new network. And this is just for logging writes to have some notion of um, does the model improve with each epoch or not. And quite honestly, we can just run the model and see how it performs. And that's it. The model really trains very quickly. It's a small model and we can see how well, how much our accuracy improves with each epoch. We can see it begins at 60, goes up to 78 and pretty much at the at epoch number four, we are already at an accuracy of 90% and then we are almost, and then we are pretty much already at 100 at epoch 13. And now the thing is, this is important, the hyperparameter epoch is something that would really determine how much your model overfits or not. If your epoch size is like 100, but you but you already reach an accuracy of 100 in epoch 13, then you are pretty you can be pretty sure that your model will be overfitting to the data. But how can you actually quantify that? Well, we have this nice little evaluation um, script or evaluation cell, which runs um, inference on our test set, right, on data that our model has never seen before. So what do we do here? We first want to store we first want to store every prediction that we do. Then we set our model into model.evol phase because as mentioned, it is important that our dropout and our batch norm layer work differently at inference time. Then we use this torch.nograd and this is just to improve the performance of our inference a bit. You theoretically don't need to use this, but it's just best practice and it just improves the performance a lot because otherwise torch would remember this little computational graph of our neural network so it can compute the gradients and store those gradients for backpropagation but we don't want to do any backpropagation so we just can use torch.nograd so it doesn't remember or compute any gradients. And now we can simply loop over every single sample in our test set, right? Our test loader has a batch size of one. That means that we just take one sample at a time. And then we do nothing crazy. We push our one sample to our device. We produce our prediction. And then we apply a torch.sigmoid function. And actually this is quite important. I didn't mention it before because in our model, we don't actually um, apply a sigmoid function to our output, right? The sigmoid is used to actually map the output to a value between zero and one, right? Our model should produce, predict a, a value of zero and or, um, or one, but we don't do that because the binary cross entropy loss, I believe, already does so itself. So that would screw things up. It just means that it is important to do that um, manually when it doing a little evaluation or inference. So that means we now have a value between zero and one, and then we can just round down the value to a zero or round it up to a one to have an actual tag of zero or one. And then we just append it to our list. And finally, we need to do this little list comprehension in the end because we're working with data loaders and we need to squeeze the data into a proper format because we don't want to have like a list and a list and a list or whatever, right? So we just, I just ran this little line and we now have our prediction list. And now we can just compute a little confusion matrix and we'll talk about what this actually does. So first of all, the confusion matrix takes as input the actual ground truth labels, right? A list of zeros and ones for the respective outputs of the new network that we would expect. And then the exact same list, but with the predicted outputs, right? And what is a confusion matrix? I won't again go too much into detail here, but what we can see is that we have predicted 235 um, times a non-legendary Pokemon, which actually was a non-legendary Pokemon. And zero times we have predicted a non-legendary Pokemon that actually was a legendary Pokemon. And this is the true positive rate, right? We have we have predicted 20 legendary Pokemons and 20 of those were actually 
legendary Pokemons. And but we have also predicted three more legendary Pokemon that in reality weren't legendary Pokemon. So we have misclassified three Pokemon as legendary that actually weren't. Now let's look at some nice final specific cases because that is way more fun of course. I won't go over this code, it's the exact same pre-processing that we did before. Um, I just sample here a legendary poke Pokemon and in this case I would just sample a random Pokemon, but let's just run this, run this code and see what it produces. So we see that we have sampled a legendary Pokemon, Kyorg, I honestly don't know how to pronounce it, and our neural network has predicted a 1, so it thinks that this Pokemon is a legendary Pokemon, right? It takes only the stats that we have, not the image, but it's just for visualization. We can run this cell once again, and we now have Zigard, I guess, <laughs> um, and this is again pretty good correctly as a legendary Pokemon. Once more, we have Raikou, which is again a legendary Pokemon. Amazing, it's just so cool. I, I, I Maybe I'm just the only one excited, but let's just sample a random Pokemon and we can see that this Gibble is not a legendary Pokemon and this was its certainty, right? Its score that it mapped between zero and one. We can again run it a further time. Again, obviously no legendary Pokemon. And one final time, this again, Starmie is no legendary Pokemon. So I personally find this to be very cool. <laughs> Congratulations, you have reached the end of our little machine learning tutorial on classifying Pokemon as legendary or not. In this series, we've built a small but powerful neural network using PyTorch to classify Pokemon with the best possible accuracy. And to achieve this accuracy, we had to use a few tricks in our little toolbox. So I hope that you've enjoyed watching these videos and I hope that you could learn a lot about Pokemon and also machine learning. If that was the case, don't forget to like this video and also don't forget to subscribe if you want to see future cool little projects. And of course, with that said, as always, thank you very, very much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!